afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this week's Grand Round. We have, again, a special guest. This is Dr. <laughs> Cesar H. Garcia. He is a geriatrics fellow for us here at the GREC and out of the bar shop in Tesca's G&G and Palliative Medicine Division. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 2001 with a degree in professional studies in Spanish. He graduated from Utesca in 2006 and completed an internal medicine residency at the Regional Academic Center, I mean, Academic Health Center in 2009. Dr. Garcia's, Dr. Garcia's interests include playing the guitar, singing Spanish music, and Notre Dame football. <laughs> His grand round topic today is health literacy associations between Hispanic elderly patients and their caregivers. So please give him a warm round of applause. I wanted to start off by thanking, uh, thanking you all for inviting me to talk about my research project that I um, conducted over the past year. Um, I became interested in the topic of health literacy um, when I was in residency. My residency director um, uh, advocated that <coughs> patients with low health literacy um, we needed to um, emphasize providing better communications for, for that population. Um, one of the examples that I had when I was in residency is uh, patients that were returning to the, to the ER um, after being discharged and they just didn't understand their discharge instructions and it was, it was, uh, <coughs> it was something that kind of was a red flag to me um, when I would see them in the ER and unfortunately they would have to be readmitted and, and uh, treated again for heart failure so um, exacerbation. Then the second uh, experience I had was in the clinic where we had patients that had chronic diseases and um, they would show up to their appointments, but then um, they just didn't change behavior. We recommended for them to take medicines, and then they would come back and they were still not taking the medicines. And uh, we would uh, label them non-compliant, but um, the truth is when you ask them, uh, so what were you supposed to do, they couldn't answer you what medicines they were on, why were they taking them, they just didn't understand the information. So I took interest in that, and in the valley where I were, I, I did my, my training, there was a lot of Spanish speakers, so I wanted to find a tool that could identify those uh, patients who had um, low health literacy, because I felt like I was not taking them as good as I could. Um, <clears throat> so when I came to, to fellowship, I was interested in that, and I pursued a, an advanced geriatric fellowship, where um, I had the opportunity to, to look at that question, that, that or those questions that, I, that could identify uh, patients with low health literacy, but then I also became interested in caregivers, because in our population, <clears throat> uh, many times they have disabilities and we have to depend on caregivers to help us um, with, with chronic disease management. And so I wanted to see how that relationship affected uh, the patient outcomes. Uh, but more than anything, um, just the communication between them. So <clears throat> I guess that's my introduction. Before uh, I get started on the actual talk, I wanted to thank the Islamic Hartford Foundation uh, for their um, support. Uh, the study couldn't have been possible without <coughs> funding so that I had time to go collect the information. And I collected a survey of 174 patient caregiver diets or 348 um, participants over a one-year period. Um, my primary mentor was Dr. Hela Hasuda and she uh, is an epidemiologist um, who also has um, a lot of experience with uh, Mexican-Americans and and looking at the cultural factors that, that, that could uh, play a role in, in communication and health outcomes. And then the, the staff here at the Health Science Center, Dr. Lichtenstein, Dr. Spinoza, uh, Dr. Chido, Dr. Oaks, uh, part of the leadership here, they have been my, my um, part of my research committee advisors and mentors and helped me with the analysis and stuff. Like that. And then I was <coughs> concurrently finishing up my Master's of Science in Clinical Research. So um, I met some professors that have been helping me with statistics, Dr. Cornell, the statistician, and then with data management, uh, uh, Ms. Fowler. Uh, and, then, and then I also had help from research assistants and from the Utesca clinical staff, uh, both here at the VA and then also at Santa Rosa and at the MARC. So I'm very thankful for them. So it takes all this manpower to get a research study done, that kind of what I did. So the objectives for today, um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> present to you the factors that are um, social factors that are protective against low health literacy among Hispanic elderly and their caregivers. So what did I find? What were the findings? Second, I'm going to um, tell you why it's important to, to, to understand 
health literacy and it's, it's in particular patients who have low health literacy because of how it affects the healthcare system, both individually and in populations. And then the third thing is to look at that question that I um, validated in the Spanish speaking population in, in my residency program and to see if it's applicable to an older population. So first, the definition of health literacy, this was adopted from, uh, by the Institute of Medicine from um, Healthy People uh, 2010. Um, it's also been um, adopted by the Affordable Care Act. And the definition is, is long and complex, but um, it kind of mentions the, 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 the idea that healthcare is, is got to be high quality healthcare and is patient driven. So patients need to be able to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions to, to, in order to follow treatment. So, so it's very, it's, it's got a lot of domains. One is you, you have, they have to be able to, to have access to the information. They have to be able to process it, and you can, you, that is complex, um, especially in our older population where there could be cognitive impairment, vision problems, um, cultural factors, uh, language differences. And then they have to understand basic information. And this is where, as a clinician, you have an opportunity to make a big difference because if you assess understanding um, and, if, and if they're able to understand you, then you've empowered them to hopefully change behavior, which is ultimately what you want, is you want to make, for them to make appropriate health decisions and follow treatment. So the impact of, of low health literacy, <clears throat> it's, it's prevalent in certain populations more than others. So for example, the older population is a high risk population. And another population is minority groups, in particular Hispanics have been shown to have um, high levels of low health literacy. Um, and the other reason why I looked at that population, part of it, because it's a, it's, a, it's a large population here in San Antonio, so I have access to that population, but also it's a fast growing population in the United States. And so we have to um, consider how low health literacy will impact their health care. Um, so I mentioned already Hispanics and older adults are some of the groups and the reason we care is because in terms of patient outcomes um, low health literacy is, is associated with, with increased mortality and also a systematic review came out that showed that it's also uh, associated with worse health outcomes and poor use of healthcare services and when I, when I started I mentioned about going to the ER instead of going to primary care clinics um, that, that's something that has been shown and, and uh, or lack of understanding of information and medication adherence. And so all these factors then lead to increased healthcare costs. So you increase use, uh, healthcare, inappropriate use of healthcare services then leads to increased costs. And that's an important point because right now we're trying to provide not only high quality care, but also um, making it more um, accessible to everybody and that includes being cost effective. So <clears throat> a study done in 2003 Literacy, literacy, uh, literacy study found that 14% of the population, or 30 million people, had below basic uh, uh, literacy levels. And out of those, about 41% were Hispanics. So that was the biggest group. Here in San Antonio, um, uh, the San Antonio um, Health Collaborative uh, did a study back in 2006, this is the data that I got off the internet. Um, where they found that about 15% of the population that, that uh, took the survey, completed the survey, had uh, low health, uh, low health literacy. Now, <clears throat> that's combining the um, using a tool called the STOFLO, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. But um, I found higher rates of that. Part of it is because they also looked at a bigger uh, uh, or age range group, and I looked at an older population, which is already higher risk. So that could be part of the reason. Um, so some of the <coughs> limitations or gaps in research is the limited information on Hispanic elderly in, in, in the literature of health literacy um, from different um, backgrounds, different demographic regions. And then there's absence of data regarding the caregiver health literacy. Nobody has actually measured that, so this is, like a, the, to my knowledge, the first study that has looked at that. And then um, the, this tool that I'm, the, the scripts Quick screening questions um, have been translated into Spanish, and as I said, I looked at it in a younger population, but um, more data is needed in older populations than in Spanish speakers. So, <clears throat> some of the objectives that, that um, uh, were measured during the, the study was to look at the 
health status of the patient. So everything was a, it was a survey. So um, I was looking at relationships of patient's health status. And, and then at the same time looking at predictors of low health literacy, what could um, alert clinicians to kind of um, be sensitive about patients that might be at risk for having low health literacy. And I looked at the same thing for caregivers because in older populations, the majority of caregivers sometimes are spouses or, or children, grandchildren, but, but, but uh, so, so it's more of an older population as well. The third um, was to look at this relationship among the diets, the patient caregiver diets, health literacy levels, and then the fourth was to screen that, uh, to, to compare the screening questions with the validated tool, which is seven minutes long, which in clinical practice that makes it more difficult to, to, to uh, in terms of practicality. So this study was a cross-sessional survey, um, and basically um, it took over a year to, to, to collect all the data. Uh, it took over a year and a half to come up with a design and make sure everything was, was planned ahead. Um, so we were able to collect 174 patient caregiver diets. So this was the inclusion criteria. Both the patient and the caregiver had to agree to participate. Uh, data was collected on site wherever we recruited them and they also had the option to have the data collected at a future uh, visit either in their home or in the clinics. Um, initially I had, it was a challenge to recruit participants so then I expanded it to senior centers and I was able to reach my goal. Uh, exclusion criteria included if they had a corrected vision worse than 2100 in both eyes using the Rosenbaum handheld chart, as well as having an MMSC score of less than 18, and I use those tools because those are, are standardized tools that have a lot of, uh, been used uh, many times in research. So these were some of the patient health status variables that I looked at, so I'm looking at functional status, I looked at IADLs and ADLs, or your, uh, can they function in the community and can they can they uh, take care of themselves? Uh, looking for disability uh, symptoms. And then the, uh, depressive symptoms, this was the GDS-15, which is a short version, but it consists of 15 questions, and they respond either they have the symptom or they don't, and then you add the, the, the scores up for a total amount of to, to kind of have the severity of, of symptoms. Um, I also measured hearing impairment because that's very common in elderly and that could affect the way they receive information. And I used an amplifier uh, for those uh, participants that had difficulty here. Um, <clears throat> I also looked at comorbidities and medications as those are some of the uh, things that could also be um, markers of, of health status. And then the mini mental state exam itself as part of the functional assessment is also memory function. Some of the covariates um, that, I, that could impact uh, understanding and looking at different groups is age, gender, the language when the ESTOFLA was administered since I'm looking at bilingual uh, participants, education level, which um, it makes sense that education, higher education would be protective or the same goes if they didn't have an education, it would be difficult to understand information in terms of literacy, written information. However, some studies have shown that even uh, persons who have finished high school um, still have difficulty with health information. And part of it is because the, the system is not geared to make things clear and simple. Um, and that's where we can get better. And there's a big initiative trying to provide clear and simple information across all populations, not just those with low health literacy. Um, <clears throat> I also looked at acculturation, because again, I'm looking at cultural factors in the Hispanic population, and one is assimilation of English language into, into their daily lives as being protective. And this uh, uh, was validated by my mentor, Dr. Hasuda. I also looked at the relationship between the, the caregiver and the patient. So <clears throat> the variable that to measure low health literacy was a validated tool that has been used in multiple studies, but again, it's difficult to implemented in daily practice because it takes about seven minutes to conduct. And this is supposed to be the short test. This is, there's a longer version. And ESTOFLA stands for the short test of functional health literacy. The questions that, that to me are more applicable in clinical practice are um, were developed by Chu et al. Um, in an uh, English-speaking population. These were later translated into Spanish. Um, as I said, I, I was able to validate it in, in a, uh, middle-aged uh, Spanish-speaking population in the valley. 
there was another study that was done in California, and they were they found um, they also were able to validate it in a diabetic older or middle aged older population, younger than 65, but kind of older than what I, I had seen in, in the valley. So the the yes tofla is is it consists of two reading passages. One is written at a tenth grade reading level. The other one is at a fourth grade reading level. And um, the scoring is is from um, there's there's a they use a modified clause procedure which um, basically um, they omit a word and in each sentence and then they're supposed to decide what word is missing uh, kind of multiple choice um, and then what the responses that they get correct that, that um, increases the the number of, of points they get and so the higher the score so the better it is is the date that they're understanding the information so greater than 23 is considered adequate and, and there's and their um, recommendations of, of applying the, the tool and less than 16 is considered inadequate but then there's a middle group called the marginal group which they still are going to have difficulty understanding inf health information so what I did is I combined them with the inadequates to, to kind of categorize it into low because studies, studies have shown that the, Studies have done that, plus it's been shown that they have difficulty understanding information. So that's what that would say there. So these were the three screening questions. And, uh, and underneath, uh, in small print or in Spanish. But it's uh, how often do you have someone help you read hospital materials? How confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? And how often do you have problems learning about your medical condition because of trouble understanding written information? When I translated it into Spanish, the, the first question, instead of saying in the hospital, because this, this was validated initially in a, in a surgical outpatient uh, clinic, um, <clears throat> I actually uh, changed it to in the clinic because I was looking at a primary outpatient clinic, primary care clinic. Um, that was the most sensitive questions that I found um, had the best accuracy um, in, 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 in the Valley uh, study. How confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? Um, has later been found that it's more sensitive when, when, when using a bigger population. And so I was thinking that that might be something that I was going to find as well. So <clears throat> the measures, um, this is just more like a, the type of measures that were collected, continuous, dichotomized variables of the, of the health literacy tool. Um, we were trying to determine the factors that were protective against low health literacy or to identify patients with low health literacy and uh, we, sus we, we uh, hypothesized that low levels of health literacy would be associated <coughs> with higher levels of physical and cognitive problems in patients and then the same thing low levels of health literacy would be associated with higher levels of physical and cognitive problems in caregivers so these are the results um, <coughs> so you have uh, patients and caregivers and on average, caregivers were 10 years younger than, than the patients. Um, caregivers were more likely to be female. Um, patients were slightly more likely to be male. Education level caregivers um, had um, higher education than the patient. Um, they had better vision, um, better MMSC score, and they were more acculturated in terms of uh, assimilating English language uses in their daily lives and there was no differences in depression. Um, the majority of the relationship of caregiver uh, patient <coughs> relationship was spouses, 64%, followed by child, grandchild. And then there was a minority, but there were some that were higher caregivers or friends, or siblings, nieces, and nephews. These were actually the, <coughs> the, the mean school, uh, or the, the the sum score um, and, and the means as well. So, so caregivers who took the S TOFLA in, in English had the highest scores, followed by patients who took the S TOFLA in English, followed by caregivers who took the S TOFLA in Spanish, followed by patients who took the S TOFLA in Spanish. And all those were significant within groups and then comparing each other to patients and caregivers. Um, further analysis, so we looked at uh, education. Um, Spanish speakers, on average, had a significant difference in terms of education. So, so that's something to be sensitive about. And so, as I was mentioning, this is the actual um, low health literacy versus adequate health literacy groups, comparing them, and, and talking about the language difference. So patients, 
and caregivers. The percent of local literacy is much higher on the Spanish speaker, Spanish speaking uh, Hispanic patients versus English speaking Hispanic patients. And also among caregivers, although caregivers did not have to be uh, Hispanic, the majority were, but the caregivers who took it in Spanish also had um, higher rates of local literacy. So this table is looking at the predictors or the the variables that are associated with low health literacy in caregivers and patients. And we found a lot of variables that were associated with the, the star, meaning how significant the more stars, the more significant. So in, in patients, it was age, and that was categorized into uh, four, four different groups. But either continuous or categorical, there, there was a difference. Then uh, there was no difference by gender. Education, definitely that there was a difference. Um, less than high school education is high risk. Acculturation, there, there was a, a difference. Um, more acculturated is protective. Um, language, when the, they took the interview, uh, the estofa was significant also. That was associated with low health literacy if they took it in Spanish. Spousal relationship was also significant, so if, if having a spouse. Um, sometimes it was protective, like for example, um, for patients, but then for caregivers, it was high risk compared to other, other, other relationships. Um, MMSC was significant, and then also vision impairment. But then when we looked at it in the model, and we adjusted in addition to all the, those variables, putting them all together, what stood out? Well, for patients, it was not age, but it was education, as well as the MMSC and vision. And that makes sense because when you're when measuring the the S tofla, uh, or you're you're taking the S tofla, you have cognitive impairment and vision problems that would affect. Um, but it's interesting because before other studies have found that it's age, and, and we did find it unadjusted, but then when we adjusted, it wasn't really. Age. In caregivers, um, it was age. Um, the category age. Um, so the the older you you were. The, the higher the risk that you had low health literacy, um, but not education. Instead, it was acculturation that stood out in English uh, or, or um, in caregivers. So those who um, use English language in their daily life, if you're a caregiver, so if you were to ask them, that's protective. So that that would be helpful to, to kind of have an idea. And then the MMSC score again, that makes sense, but not vision. And I guess also because maybe the variance wasn't as much in the, in the caregiver population. So now characteristics of um, the patient's health status and by health literacy levels. And what I found is that low health literacy patients have worse health status. They have, they're more likely to have functional disabilities. They're more likely to have lower MMSC scores. No differences in hearing or about seeing. They were more likely to have worse vision. There was no difference in number of health problems. Could it be that maybe they were underreporting because they don't understand their health conditions? It's possible. Or they're not going to see doctor's business so they haven't been able to get diagnosed with certain diseases. Awesome. Um, number of medicines, uh, really I didn't um, find no differences. In acculturation, it was more likely that those that had adequate health literacy uh, used English language in their daily lives. Um, they were more uh, likely to have higher education levels, that's the, the years, uh, 12 versus 6. Um, no differences in, in depressive symptoms, um, age, um, Low health literacy patients tend to be older. Um, caregivers uh, with adequate health literacy were more likely to be male. And there are higher rates of low health literacy in those who took the SOFA in Spanish. So some of the stuff I have covered, but now we're looking at just the patients by adequate versus low health So then I looked at the model in, in, in health uh, 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 status. and, and uh, Pretty much it was strongly associated again. In addition, we been putting in the model with functional status, MMSC score, memory. Uh, I, I um, looked at just the, the memory function part of the MMSC because the MMSC looks at education and there are, uh, other factors, and this was just looking at the memory domain and then vision impairment as well. Now, this is for caregivers. For caregivers, it was uh, significant for, uh, or it was trending because it was 0 0.07 for IADLs, which makes sense because, um, uh, I mean, if you're a caregiver, hopefully you don't have basic ADL disability. But so those, the, the numbers were really low, but for IADLs, it was, it was starting to show a difference there. 
Um, with MMSC scores, again, um, low health barriers for patients had higher uh, or lower scores. Um, no differences with hearing. Um, there, was, there was a difference in vision. Um, there was a difference in number of health problems, so low health literacy patients who are caregivers are more likely to have more health problems. Um, the difference again in, in education level and acculturation. So here in the model, however, the only the only um, it was trending was was MMSC score, and the other uh, once you put it in a model that you, you didn't have significance. So, uh, so what are the conclusions? So, <coughs> lower education, MMSC scores, and worse vision are predictors of low health literacy among patients. And low health literacy was strongly associated with patients' health status. That increased, increased the risk for this, or report of disability, worse cognitive function, and worse vision score. Um, um, this is, as a clinician, you should um, try to um, be sensitive to these things if you ask them in your clinical history, as well as try to provide um, clear, simple communication to all groups. Um, and I'm going to go over some tools that have been used in populations, and we need to see if uh, they work across all groups, and, and uh, more research needs to be done. So, um, for caregivers, on the other hand, it was being younger, having uh, no memory impairment or having higher MMSC scores and being more acculturated. Th those were protective and caregivers against low health literacy. And uh, we did find unadjusted that it was associated with certain um, health status, uh, functional status uh, variables, but, and, and there was more health problems, but then in the actual model, it really didn't find a difference. Um, but it kind of shows you that, that, um, that we need to be sensitive to caregivers. Um, because uh, the next question, which was to see the relationship of the health literacy levels, is kind of implying that we should consider caregivers in, in, in their health literacy in terms of caring for, for patients. So this is the third question, um, or the third hypothesis, was that low levels of health literacy in caregivers would be associated with low levels of health literacy in patients. So um, that's what we thought would be a trend. So. Um, this is what we found. So <clears throat> on the x-axis, you can see caregiver low, patient low. So that, that's just saying what was the, the, the matching health literacy levels. So low health literacy, both in, in the diet, the patient, and the caregiver, there were 42 diets like that. Mm -hmm. I'm suspecting that would not be a good thing in terms of health, health status of the patient. That was a, 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 a large percentage of the diets. Um, about a quarter of them. Then <coughs> the caregiver adequate and patient adequate was also about the same. So those are, you would think that that would be, that would be a good situation to have if you're a provider. Um, another potentially source of a, a good intervention for you to utilize caregivers is when the caregiver has adequate health literacy and the patient had low health literacy. And that was about 70, 71 patient caregiver diets. And then surprising, there was about 12 diets where the caregiver had low health literacy, but the patient had adequate health literacy. And you can see how that would be a problem when you're communicating with these diets, because um, especially in Hispanics, where personal uh, or cultural factors such as personalismo might have, uh, which means that uh, they, it's the trust um, relationships. Sometimes they don't feel the trust with the caregiver, with the provider, but they do feel it with family relatives. And so then they're going to go for help uh, to ask advice, and they might be giving them advice that you don't, that are not. It's probably not, not a good thing for them it's about health problems or how to treat their health problems. Um, the Spearsman's role in the campus statistic just is showing that there was no agreement. We did not find it. Our hypothesis was that there was going to be an agreement. We didn't find an agreement. And we just uh, found a large variety of, of, of diets. Um, one, one more thing is that um, if you look at the different colors in the bar, bar graph, is the 28 versus 14, that, that's the, the patients who took the yes total in Spanish in the diet was much higher uh, to have caregiver uh, with low health literacy versus if they took it in English. And so that was one other thing that we found and that was significant. Um, so, so the findings are that, um, as I said, the wide variety. Interesting because that's that's the reality of, of 
of the diets um, that I found. I mean, like, this is just this one sample, but who knows what, what else we, we would encounter in, in, in daily clinical practice. This is the first study to look at that. So it would be nice to kind of see other studies and see what um, <clears throat> We found that older Hispanic patients with, with low health literacy were more likely to have a caregiver with low health literacy, and I mentioned that. And this was more common in those who took it in Spanish. Later on, we find out that it wasn't that they took it in Spanish, but it was it was um, it was other factors like education that, that, that Spanish speakers have lower education. Um, <clears throat> so so now the the next step is is when you have patients and so so we've always uh, focused on the patient, but now I'm saying that we should also consider the caregiver because if the caregiver has low health literacy, that can potentially affect the health out status of the patient. And so we should consider both when we're treating uh, diseases, chronic disease management, when we utilize caregivers. So some of the tools that you can use to communicate with patients with low health literacy <coughs> for physicians was to use their so well-known um, the teach back method, which is just basically um, to assess understanding and clarification. And this is the whole uh, high quality patient care should be um, uh, making sure not just that we provide information, but that we make sure that they understood what we provide information. And if we don't, we need to clarify it and make it simple for them. And, and uh, so it's patient-centered. The second thing is for patients, and I would add for caregivers, is to advocate empowerment and tell them to um, have uh, change the culture, that we want them to ask questions. And when we send them to specialists and to do procedures or you know, navigate the healthcare system, that they are advocates of their health and they um, ask questions. So this is the teach back method. You explain information, let's say that you change their, their insulin. Um, it's not enough to just change the insulin and, and not assess if they understood the information um, because they might not change the behavior. So if you clarify it, if you ask them a question like, a, can, so can you summarize what we talked about today in the office visit? And then you can put the ball on their court to see if they understood you. And if they don't, 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 don't um, just uh, intervene right away and tell them, you know, this is what I wanted to tell you. And that gives you another chance to, to educate. And finally, hopefully, if you do that, um, it would improve understanding. That's, that's potentially what we want. And then at the same time, um, if we do it all the time, and hopefully multiple people in your, in your healthcare organization and team does it, it would speed up the process and you might have better outcomes of, of, of chronic disease management and understanding this. Um, <clears throat> so these are the ask me three for the patients. And this is something that you can educate your patients and caregivers to say whenever you go see uh, another specialist or another doctor or another uh, you know, provider, what is what is my main problem and what do you want me to what do I need to do? So, and then why is it important for me to do this? And so that also is helpful because now you're 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 engaging them to, to take care of their health. So the fourth uh, hypothesis was that the Spanish screening questions would be valid, validated in, in an older population. And so that's what we're going to look at next. So this is the area of the rock curve for, for um, the screening questions. And the area of the rock curve is just basically the accuracy of the screening test that you're using compared to a gold standard, which in this case was the s And the black line in the middle is just basically no difference in terms of the uh, the ability for that test to work. It's just by flipping a coin. And the more it goes up, we're into the top left. The the bigger the area of the rock curve, and the better the test is. So we found that the second question, the fitting out medical forms question, was the most um, accurate in detecting patients with low health literacy in English speaking patients. That's what they found later, and this this was interesting to 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 verify that. It's good to add to the literature that this does work also in Hispanic, elderly, English-speaking patients. So what about in um, Spanish-speaking uh, Hispanic elderly patients? It was a smaller sample. There was 87 uh, people who were 65 and older. Um, they were, they, they, we um, measured this, and, and we found that the second question, again, filling out medical forms in Spanish, that, that question is very sensitive. Or it, it, did, it pre performed pretty well. It was better than in English-speaking patients. Um, 
So that's that's that was very helpful. And and so this this is uh, the, so so the, the conclusion is the filling out medical forms was the the most sensitive to, the, had the highest accuracy. And so this is something practical that potentially you could use. Although the advocate is that we should treat everybody, communicate clearly, and 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 uh, and not treat, but communicate in clear, simple information uh, with everyone. Don't even try to measure it because it's it's so common that we want to make sure we communicate clearly. But as a clinician, it's nice um, to kind of have a clinical reminder or something to say. You know what? This person, even before I go into the room, to remind me. You know, make sure you be sensitive to this. Um, <clears throat> so this can be helpful for future studies as well because when you have a single question you can start looking at associations, which is instead of using that seven minute test. So these were the questions again. So that second question that performed the best was how confident are you fitting out medical forms by yourself? Um, and then the translation is in Spanish. And then they respond from always to never, so it's a, it's a five point, a five response. And, and, or extremely to not at all, depending on the question. So, so this would be from extremely to not at all for the fitting out medical forms. So the bottom line for the study is that our population had a large portion of Hispanic elderly and their caregivers with low health literacy. And low health literacy in patients and in caregivers is strongly associated with poor health status, more in patients than in caregivers, which is, which is you, know, you would depend on the caregiver, they would be more functional. Um, and then we did validate the single question in Spanish speaking uh, Hispanic elderly patients that, that they, um, it, it could be used as a tool to identify local literacy patients. And that's that's all I have. Any questions? Uh, yes, I have an important question. So the this TOFLA is a written test, right? Are you advocating more for a verbal test? Yeah. And secondly, um, did you identify code switching? between the Spanish-speaking um, and English-speaking patients? No, I mean, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, what I found in this study with the English language usage is that um, even if they speak Spanish, they might not read Spanish. Mm -hmm. So um, with oral communication with Hispanics here in the U.S., oral communication might be more important than written information. And the way we communicate right now is written information is simple, but oral is, 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 is if, well, you have language also that could be a factor, make it harder, barriers. Um, the code switching, I don't know too much about it. If you want to expand on it, that would be great, because <laughs> I don't know much about it. So. What is it? Uh, code switching? Yeah. Um, it's uh, uh, switching back and forth between English and Spanish. Oh. And usually, um, whether English-speaking or Spanish-speaking patients, um, who are bilinguals, they use it back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, especially their sensitive subjects, they will replace another word, um, even though they are English speakers. Even though they're English speakers, they will replace another word uh, for a more sensitive subject. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's interesting, and that's why I was um, thinking about more of an oral test for health literacy versus a written test um, for all those those reasons. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if you found that. No, and other studies that also would, I would want to know is uh, this uh, spoken communication by um, asking these, ask me through questions, and, and also the teach back. If it's done in the native languages, is, is it as 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 effective in that population? Because we're we found that it's an English speaking patient, but we're assuming that if I translated into Spanish, I would get the same effect. And not I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know the answer. But I would like to do that. I mean, yeah. I, I speak Spanish. Um, any other questions? I mean, when you first start, you know, when you're embarking on this, there was some concern as to how people with, with low health literacy would respond to having to go through this testing for health literacy. Would that make be awkward or difficult for them? What What did you observe? Um, so there's some things that um, you know having to do with oh, testing. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, so, so overall, when I introduced the, the study, because I want to, I had to get informed consent, um, I wanted to make sure they understood what they were going to participate in. Uh, they were very, um, they had positive responses, to, because I would 
say that this is to help us understand better how to communicate better. And uh, they think that's a major problem. So they, they were positive about it. I did have a minority of patients because it has been shown that sometimes Hispanics are less trusting. Minority populations are like that because they feel like they're going to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, but that was actually very little. And that really didn't come to that much. I had a good recruitment experience. So people had sort of altruistic motives that really thought that it was an important issue and you know, wanted yeah, to Yeah, and, 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 and exactly. They, they, so it was, it was a positive response. Yeah. And, and they, they, had, uh, they wanted this, the healthcare system to change yeah. to help them. Is there a way of identifying health literacy according to the complexity of the task you're asking them about? Because surely <coughs> some tasks are easy, relatively easy to understand, and others would be relatively complex. And they might be able to perform well in the simple things like take these pills three times a day for a week until you run out. It might be something simple, but something more complex is the way that I don't get that. Is there a way of differentiating between so there's different levels of health literacy? Yeah, so no, those are good questions. Simple um, or complex? So there are different tests that test different parts of literacy. Um, for example, there's like we were talking about oral communication. Um, there's also tools that measure numeracy, which is numbers, which is important if you're telling them to change their insulin or their Coumadin in, in medication management, that would be critical. Um, there's, uh, so, so there are tools out there that you can focus on a certain domain. The, the complexity of health literacy, and this is why it's so important, is because um, they want to change to a patient driven service uh, to, to really try to provide high quality patient care. And it has to cover a lot of domains in order to do that. Access, processing, understanding, and then empowering them to change behavior. So yeah, I mean, it's test driven. And that would be the next phase of, of health literacy is to see how it affects every task that you would do. Mm -hmm. That would be the future. Any reason why you choose MMSE compared to or yeah, no, that's a good question. I used it, a uh, part of it, my mentor team, uh, we, we all decided that this was a good tool because it's been used in the past. And it's been used in multiple research studies, the MMSC. The problem that you run into, and I had to get, um, I had to pay a fee to utilize this, the tool. So it costs a lot of money. But it's been bad at the Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.